Well, hello everybody. My name is Richard Edmonds and I've been fossil collecting on this coast for oh, 50 years. Yeah, I picked up a little ammonite on Charmouth Beach in 1971. Ended up doing a degree in geology at Hull University. Came back and ran the centre at Charmouth for many years before moving to Dorset County Council, where I ended up as the Earth Science Manager for the World Heritage Site, which I quit six years ago for reasons that are going to become pretty apparent. Um, so, yeah, this is a, uh, a long-held um, ambition, if you like, not just by me, but by a lot of people, for something fabulous for West Dorset. Um, and this talk really follows on from a previous one I did, which is on Steve Etch's Museum of Jurassic Life website, World Heritage, What Went Wrong? A quick summary of that uh, is that something like £37 million has been spent on capital projects in the name of World Heritage, and none of them provide a home for the amazing fossils from West Dorset. Um, despite the fact that the collectors put that forward, and in 2012, myself and Richard Forrest, we started to visualise and scope out what that project might look like, but it received no support because that support was going to a project called Seaton Jurassic, uh, primarily because Devon wanted something in Devon to justify their investment in World Heritage. And unfortunately, um, it cost five and a half million pounds and it failed after just four years. And I think the Devon Wildlife Trust who operated it lost the best part of half a million pounds. It's extraordinary how you could mess up that badly, but that's what they did. The other aspect is that uh, the West Dorset coast is the richest source of lower Jurassic reptiles, fish and insects anywhere in the world. That's quite an extraordinary statement. Um, I did the fossil collecting code um, as part of the bid for World Heritage because we knew there'd be a need to demonstrate management. Um, but we took the view that it's only the collectors who go out and rescue the stuff. No one else is going to do it. No one's going to provide the effort required um, is the collectors and if we sort of try to to control or restrict what they did we'd end up having to force uh, police the beach which would just be a nonsense so it's a very um, collaborative kind of approach and all it requires is for the collectors not to dig in the cliffs and uh, not in situ that is and to record their important finds and offer them to museums if they're to be sold or donated and over the 20 years um, only 11% have actually gone to museums because the collectors are still holding on to their best finds in the sort of hope and expectation that World Heritage will deliver their vision for the World Heritage Site. And yet that vision, that project is, is last on the list of any, um, any capital projects. And so the collectors are left wondering what on earth are they going to do with their specimens? So why am I doing this? Well, first of all, it's to illustrate to those powers that be the scale of the lost or missed opportunity. Um, it's to demonstrate that there clearly are enough fossils to uh, to to fulfil the vision of the collectors. Um, it's to demonstrate how easy it is to select the fossils when you have a project in mind. If you know what you want them for, it's very easy. And it's to promote the idea to anyone who might be interested, anyone who, who thinks, wow, that's something we should be doing. I've got a few notes. Um, I've only consulted some of the collectors. I, I know I don't need to talk to the others. I've just taken their fossils and, and used them. And these are simply my ideas. There, other people may have different ideas or you merge all those ideas together and end up with uh, something even better still. Um, that's part of the actual process, you know, where a consensus should be found and also a value placed on the specimens. But, you know, that's not my job. Somebody else should be doing that. So here it is, here's the gallery, really just a box, simple as that, in plan view. Here it is, um, looking in through the door. In fact, there we are looking in through the door. Um, and what are we gonna call it? I mean, this is something I've really struggled with. Um, is it the Lower Jurassic Coast Collection? Hmm, that's a bit dull, isn't it? What about Mesozoic World? I, I think the public are ready for the Mesozoic. And this this uh, exhibit would talk about that a bit more. I've got the, I've got a part two which which does that. What about that? The lost world of the Mesozoic. I like that very much. Or wonders of the lost world, perhaps. You know, 
but it is quite challenging. There, there's, there's no simple or obvious um, name. And here's the gallery space. We can simply scroll around it. And it's obviously completely unpopulated. The builders have just moved out. The electricians have plumbed in the lighting. Um, it's ready to go. And so why are we doing this? Um, it's to secure the important fossils so they can be studied by science. Uh, new species can't be described until they're secured in a museum uh, because obviously the people need to have access to them in, in years to come. Um, but it's also to, to really embrace the collectors and showcase their role in the management of the site. Really, you know, they are, they are the, the heroes of world heritage. Uh, to use the fossils as an educational tool, that's through interpretation, which I'll come back to, and to promote the coast all year. Although you could argue that we're busy enough, certainly are this year. Um, but, you know, this is a, still a really fabulous, unrealised opportunity for the coast both in terms of education and special interest tourism. So on the interpretation front, I'm a very much a sort of from the gut interpreter because I had all those years at Charmouth, but it is very useful to write down what it is you'd want people to learn or feel or do as a result of coming to your exhibit. And in terms of learning, it's simply promoting an understanding of the natural world, but through a geological perspective. So that's through the processes at work on the earth and geological time, really important and really undervalued. Um, feeling an affinity to the natural world is what we want to do. And doing is going out so outside, exploring, you know, engaging with the centers and museums on the coast, getting involved, getting excited. Um, and then what are the themes uh, that we could employ here? Uh, outstanding universal value, that's, the case for world heritage in terms of fossils, life under the Jurassic Sea and life on the land, obvious stories, incredible stories. They're, they're related to the specimens. There are many fantastic stories related to individual specimens or collections. Say extinction, the big driver for evolution, that's a big one. How fossils form and how they're found. The story of uh, oil, which is a liquid fossil. I think that's really important. Beautiful fossils, well, you know, why not? 200 years of discovery, that's the scientific process, both in the past right up to the present day. And then the dynamic coast, that's um, the role of erosion in uncovering the fossils for us. And these, I'm only gonna really cover these first four today, um, but these other two, the extinction and the oil, I think are really important and relative stories. Um, and the other great thing is that we've, we've already got a list of fossils, a fantastic catalog because West Dorset Code has been running for 20 years. There's over 400 specimens in there, category one specimens, unique specimens, category two are superb exemplars, educational uh, specimens. This is our resource. We don't need to go anywhere else. It's here. And I've created a virtual design tool called Edoba, which we can import text and import images uh, to the wall. So let's start with outstanding universal value. And here's our design tool. We're gonna to import some text. We're gonna import it straight from the nomination document. The West Dorset Coast is the richest source of fossil marine reptiles, fish and insects anywhere in the world. Something like 14 species of marine reptile, 46 species of fish, unlimited numbers of insects. Pop that on the wall like that. So what about a specimen? Again, we just go to the uh, the West Dorset Fossil Code. This is a facsimile of it because I don't have access to the actual code anymore. Um, but which of those ichthyosaurs we're going to have? Um, that one. Record 99, found by Chris Moore. New species, category one. Um, we can just pop it on the wall like that. And then import some text. An ichthyosaur discovered by Chris Moore at Seatown in 2006 and thought to be new to science. Obviously, we await for its formal study. Sea Town is not recognised as containing a diverse fauna of reptiles, but collecting efforts over the last 30 years has demonstrated that it really should. So that text goes on the wall. Um, let's have another specimen, a plesiosaur this time. Go back to the list. Uh, well, again, there's, there are two candidates, but that one, really interesting because this is a really, really rare fossil. 
again category one specimen so we're going to pop it in a plinth low down so the little toddlers can put their greasy sticky fingers all over the glass and some text quite possibly the earliest and most complete pliosaurid in the world and by tens of millions of years pliosaurs are plesiosaurs that evolved into short-necked animals with massive heads and huge teeth and pliosaurus kevini in the dorset county museum is one of the largest and best preserved examples in the world it came from the upper jurassic near weymouth and as such is about 50 million years younger than this specimen so we can pop that text on the wall let's have a fish um you'll notice i've stopped doing the um looking at the code i haven't got, got the full records but look if you know anything about fossils and what's been found you know about this fantastic fish found by keith and mary stick it on the wall and some um the finest example of thorough philpotty ever found here the top part of the body the dorsal part washed away so it's just in time collected by chris by, by keith hackett and mary coates and cleaned by chris and alex moore and we all walk, walk past that uh, Keith and Mary found it. So there's the text. Let's have another fish. Let's this time have a shark, Paleosphinax, record number 165. Um, it's another category one specimen. We're going to stick it on the wall, import some text. The finest example of the fossil shark, Paleosphinax, ever found here, despite some of the body having been washed away. So that was discovered by Karen Philbin. Uh, in 2009 and prepared by her as well so that's on the wall another fish let's have this one really weird thing probably new unique probably new to science on the wall um yeah almost certainly a new species of fish and certainly new to this coast found by chris moore as as always um, and then insects adoba says they're too small and complicated to show in this format, which is true. And this is a big one, a dragonfly. Um, but yeah, there are lots of insects. They're very, very small. How you actually dem uh, um, ex ex exhibit those, I'm not really sure. But there we are. Look, outstanding universal value. Um, we've illustrated what that is for the lower Jurassic. Um, we've secured, in theory, five Category 1 specimens, so they can now be studied and described so that means that we'll have to change the numbers of it, reptiles found and fish because the science is finally moving forward again having been stalled we've celebrated the role of the collectors and we don't know what the cost is because this is a hypothetical exercise it's taken me about three hours to design the gallery select the specimens and populate the space so all done at no cost whatsoever and now we can move on to the really interesting stuff so the next story is life under the Jurassic Sea. But you know what? I'm not going to put it there. I'm going to put it here. So when you walk into the gallery, it's the first thing that hits you. Um, and what have we got? We've got ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, fish, ammonites, nautilus, cuttlefish, belemites, crinoids, starfish, lobsters, bivalves, brachiopods, tube worms, bryozoans, microfossils, and trace fossils. You know what? We're going to need a bigger wall. So back into plan view, let's turn the doors round so that when you walk in, you're facing the whole of the big long wall. We've got all of that space. And there it is. So ichthyosaurs, what can we draw on? Again, all we need to do is go back to our fossil code recording base. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out we want that one. Nearly two meter long ichthyosaur skull. <coughs> <coughs> found by Tony Gill uh, very early on actually record 27 um, fabulous fabulous fossil and to basket what else what about a little perfect ichthyosaur lying on its stomach so we can see the body form that's one I found actually and another one lying on its side so we can see the the, the, the side aspect as well obviously there are other specimens but I don't have access to them but that's one from Fion and we're going to add to basket and pop them on the wall or in the case of the huge skull in a big plinth in the middle of the room i think and what are we going to say about ichthyosaurs 
uh, they're marine reptiles that probably evolved from lizard-like animals in the early Triassic period, about 250 million years ago. They look like dolphins, which evolved from land mammals about 50 million years ago, and they look the same because, it, as a hunter, there's no point being shaped like a brick. This is known as convergent evolution, because to be an efficient hunter in the sea, the animal has to be streamlined, and that's why dolphins, whales, tuna fish, sharks all look similar. And then as for the colour, we don't know, but we can make a guess. As a hunter, there's no point being pink and purple with yellow spots. Camouflage is the answer. And all we need to do is look at modern marine reptiles, or sorry, modern marine hunters, for us to identify or suggest what the colours could be. So there we are, pop that on the wall. And then we should say something about this massive ichthyosaur skull. It's a Temdomontosaurus, which belongs to the largest group of ichthyosaurs in the lower jurassic the one that joseph and mary anning found in 1811 and it's considered to have the largest eye of any animal that ever lived so that's a pretty interesting factoid and we'll stick that on the plinth um here's a fossil poo only when it's in the hand you realize what a spectacular world-class turd that is and poo is known as coprolites um, they're from marine reptiles and sharks and they often contain fish scales which are the shiny black things you see in there, and sometimes even the bones of other reptiles inside the poos. Great things. And where are we going to put that? You know what, I, I think fantastic poo, we're going to put it in the outstanding universal value section. So plesiosaurs, what are we going to do with plesiosaurs? Again, if you know your stuff, there is only one. It's that one, found by Chris Duggan and cleaned by him and Chris Moore and Alex Moore. Fantastic, four metre long ichthyr, plesiosaur, completely articulated, prepared to perfection. But I mean, here we go, over 2,000 hours of preparation time. So you can start to get a sense of the value of some of these things. They're not inconsiderate by any means. Um, and this is a visualisation that David Lazenby did for Jurassica, the Portland project that I was involved in. Um, you know, fantastic idea to, to illustrate how you could use these things. And as for some text, it's Plesiosaurus dolichodirus, which is the commonest one. Plesiosaurs are very strange animals. When Mary Anning discovered the first one in 1823, the scientists of the time put the head on the tail. Now you might laugh, but are there any animals like the Plesiosaur alive today? Is there a giraffe fish or a giraffe whale? And the answer obviously is there's not. Um, and this is why the plesiosaur is so important, because it forced people to recognise that life was different in the past, very different. And this is decades before Charles Darwin published on the evolution of species. So we can pop that text in there. We can add one of Bob Nichols' illustrations down there too. And where are we going to put it? We're going to put it in the middle of the room again in a big gallery plinth i think because it's such a spectacular specimen fish what have we got to choose from well again i can't show you the full list but i've just chucked a few in here we definitely want dipedium and uh, nearly all of our fish are ancient and armored forms and that's why they're so well preserved the soft parts rotted inside but the heavy enameled and armored bones and skull plates are preserved so you get these perfectly preserved looking fish and we can pop that on the wall. Um, but also we've got this one, Philodophorus spratiformis, um, which is much more closely related to our modern day fish. It's less armoured, and that appears to be the result of an evolutionary arms race. The predators were getting bigger, and therefore the armour less effective. The answer was to lose the armour altogether and become faster and more agile. And looking at the diversity of fish today, you can see that strategy has clearly worked. So we pop those on the wall. And then we've got ammonites. Uh, well, look at that. If you don't get a sense of scale, here it is on display at Charmouth. Charmouth do a really good job at um, showcasing the recent finds, but they're also running out of space. And who would ever want to put that back in a cupboard or a store? It's a fantastic specimen, cleaned by Chris and Alex Moore. Um, and I'm also going to throw in my Nautilus here from Monmouth Beach. So, ammonites, we'll pop them on the wall. What are we going to say about them? 
They're some of the commonest fossils in the Jurassic Sea, and they're related to squid. Um, there are many different forms, but all have this broadly have the spiral shape, although eccentric forms did evolve at times. Um, so pop that on the wall with Bob's artwork. The Nautilus. Well, the Nautilus is the, is the closest living relative to the ammonite found in the Pacific and Indo-Pacific regions today. It's a mystery why this much more ancient animal survived the great KT extinction event when the more diverse ammonites did not. Elamites. These are the hard internal shells of a squid-like animal, and because the shell is largely solid, it sinks to the seafloor and is not crushed by the weight of the sediments as it's buried. The results are that they're just about the commonest fossil on the beach. And the old folklore name is a devil's bullet because they thought they came out of the sky during lightning storms. So we'll pop the bellamites on the wall there with their text. Um, crinoids, these are plant-like animals related to starfish because they have five sides. The simplest way to think about them is a starfish on a stalk. These forms lived on driftwood floating in the sea and waved their fine branching arms, filtering the seawater for plankton. And crinoids can still be found in tropical reefs today, while here in the UK we have the feather star, which doesn't have the long stalk, but is very similar. And also in the middle, as towards Sea Town and Eat, we've got these fabulous starfish, both big clusters of starfish and the starfish bed. Now, brittle stars today form in huge colonies on the seafloor. And the starfish bed is thought to be a single storm event that ripped a whole colony out and buried them in one moment in time. Again, Chris Moore's fantastic work there. So we can pop all of these things on the wall. It's starting to look something, isn't it? Now it's starting to get there. Now this is where you know Chris does all the best stuff. I, I'm interested in the best of the common. So things like the devil's toenail, top left, finding one with both valves is actually, I think, rarer than an ichthyosaur down here. Uh, the big plagiostomas, the giant clams, very, very common, very, very easily smashed and broken, very hard to actually rescue. Um, that oyster bed, bottom left, that's in theory quite common, but I suspect that there are very few examples like that because they're so easily smashed and broken. And then Antiquilima, this beautiful um, a decorated clamshell. Again, common, but really hard to rescue. You can even see there the bruising from the sea. They fall out of the cliff and they're smashed by the sea in a day. But also I'm interested in the things that grow on these things. So Ammonite there with oysters. These are all cleaned by Lizzie Hindley using the iron powder air abrasive, which is a revolution. So the antiquilima there on the on the right with the tube worms and the bryozoans, impossible to clean before, or well, virtually impossible, before the advent of the air abrasive, the iron powder abrasive. But there are also these fantastic sort of communities of seafloor. The Austria is, is an oyster and it can make an exact copy of the surface it grows on called a xenomorph. Sometimes you see beautiful ammonites. They actually look like ammonites, but they're oysters. Pinna is, a, is known as the fan shell. And it's very similar to a razor shell living buried in the mud. There's the plagiostoma at the bottom. Uh, Rhizocorallian is a horizontal U-shaped burrow. And then Calindrincus is thought to be a sea anemone burrow. So this is preserved from the underside. We're looking up from the bottom. And so the burrow has been filled with mud. And these are great, these assemblages, all again cleaned with the iron powder abrasive. So we're going to pop all of those down there, low down on the, to give the impression of being on the seafloor. Um, there are lobsters. They're very small and very rare and mostly in Chris Moore's collection because he's got an interest in them. Um, and then we also have burrows made by lobsters and shrimps and worms. Um, the Thalassinoides is this very large branching burrow. But we've also got the chalk and many people have noticed you know, how, how the the chalk is made of fingers of bone. Well, these are filling th Thalassinoides burrows. You get these sort of knobbly bits, which are actually the junctions where the burrows join together. And you can see them all there. This, so the flints and the chalk form in, in a very similar sort of burrow system. So pop those on the wall. Oh, what else? Brachiopods. I love these things. They're exquisite. They're tiny. 
and they're exquisite. I've, I've chosen some from the chalk because they're the biggest ones, but bottom right um, is in the lias as well. And the thing about brachiopods is that uh, they were once the, the most dominant seashell on the seafloor, and yet today there are now only about 30, 33 species left. And the difference between brachiopods and modern shells is our modern shells are, are lopsided, they're asymmetrical, whereas brachiopods are symmetrical, you cut them down the middle, they're the same on both sides. They also have this little tiny opening in the umbo, which they use to attach themselves to the seafloor. Now, what about creating huge sculptures of these things and allowing people to, to feel and handle them and explore them? I think that would be fantastic. But we can't show them on the wall because they're too small. But we're getting there, aren't we? We've got um, a really nice assemblage of fossils. There could be more. There probably should be more. There probably could be a lot more integration with artwork and illustration, maybe even some CGI. Um, but it's just there to give an idea of what the, what this thing could look like. Now on to the next story, um, life on the land. And you know what, I'm not, oh yes, there's only really one specimen, it's, it's Scalidosaurus, record 34, probably the most complete dinosaur ever found in Britain. Um, found nowhere else but here, between Charmouth and Lyme Regis. Uh, nearly all are found in just one layer, which suggests that a storm or a flood caught a herd of these animals and swept them into the sea in a moment of time. Uh, it's a, a herbivore, an armoured herbivore, and that tells us that there must be a carnivorous dinosaur out there that has not been found yet. But someday someone is going to find it. It's going to be incredible. <clears throat> so we pop that text there. Here's Bob Nichols' illustration of Scalidosaurus. You can see the armoured scoot sticking out. It's the ancestor to Stegosaurus and to the Ankylosaurs, for all you seven-year-olds. And how about that, that predator? It's going to be about three metres long, armoured, the nasty Allosaurus-type uh, mini T-Rex dinosaur. And it's got to be found sometime. There are also amazing examples of foliage and ferns and even pine cones but I don't have those to hand uh, and lots and lots of wood but the really big story here is that um, there were no flowering plants in the Jurassic so there was no oak no ash no hazel no salad no fruit no veg no grasses no cereals no hops no apples or grapes no beer cider wine or even whiskey it's a very, very strange world to think about without all of those things that we take for granted today. And there are lots more insects as well. Um, but even a humble piece of wood like that, you can make exciting because you could say, you know, just think a dinosaur could have rubbed itself against that wood 190 million years ago. <clears throat> and wood also forms um, physical obstructions on the seafloor where ammonites get tumbled up in caught up against them so you get these lovely assemblages of of ammonites um this is one i've got but there are many better examples better cleaned examples as well so there we are life on the land life under the sea and so now it's time to do something with this wall and what i'm going to do is tell some incredible stories to finish off with first of all ammonites as tools of time so ammonites evolve very rapidly, and so each rock layer contains its own distinct assemblage of ammonites. <clears throat> They're a bit like the um, the page numbers in a book, with the the the, the layers being the um the, the rock layers being the the pages. So the Monmouth Beach is the oldest. Um, by the time you get to Eep, we're into much younger rocks. And the important thing about this is that here are all the different ammonites. Uh, they're, they're, they're found in distinctly different places. I mean, Chris Andrew at the museum often says people come in with fossils and he goes, oh, you've been to Golden Cap. And they go, oh, how do you know that? Well, it's because the ammonites are distinctive. So at Charmouth, there's Asterosaurus obtusum, the absolutely classic ammonite everyone wants to find. Um, uh, also at Charmouth, but around Golden Cap to Sea Town is Tragophyloceros ibex, very different ammonite. Uh, um, down at Eep, Amalthius margaritatus with that beautiful roped or corded keel. And then Harposterus falciferum as well up at Eep in the junction bed. 
And the important thing about these is that um, they can be used to tell the relative age of the rocks. So there's Harposterus down on the coast. Here's the same or very close species from a location somewhere on the Dorset-Somerset border, which I'm not going to tell you where it is. Uh, here's the same from Ilminster, uh, where famously they plough the fields and thousands of ammonites become uncovered. And then here's the same ammonite again up at Whitby. So we know that there's a band of Jurassic rocks that joins Dorset to Yorkshire. Um, and even though the rocks are different because they're in different environments, they contain the same fossils and that tells us they're the same age. Same thing with Dactyliostris. There's an ammonite I collected from Raze 40 odd years ago. So there's a little pocket of lower Jurassic up in Raze as well. And this is what William Smith worked out, the great canal builder, that you could tell the relative age of the rocks by the fossils that they contained. And then from that, you can start making maps and maps help you identify where geological resources might be. And in a really good example of that is, is coal. This is the coal measures <clears throat> up on the Cumbria coast. <clears throat> um, and people knew that where you found black shale, you could find coal. The trouble is that um, in Dorset, we have lots of black shale in the lower Jurassic, the Oxford clay and the Kimmeridge clay. The difference is that the Carboniferous coal measures have a, an ancient type of <coughs> ammonite called a goniotite with a very simple chamber wall, which I'll talk about in a minute. Whereas in the Jurassic, we have ammonites, which are different. And if you know the difference, you'll know that the black shale with ammonites in doesn't have, isn't associated with coal, whereas the black shale with goniotites is. And as a result, there were something like 20 coal mines in Dorset, even after William Smith had produced his map people were still following that simple understanding without understanding the fossils. So we have all these zonal ammonites and also subzonal ammonites that define time down to about a quarter of a million years. And we're going to just pop them on the wall, obviously with some of the best examples we can find. Um, there we go. I feel a little bit like that artist Bob Ross, you know, with his smudge brush. Um, but interesting, the commonest ammonite, Promicrosserus, it's a useless ammonite for zonation because it actually survived for, for several million years. It's found in a lot of different beds of rock. Um, the other interesting thing about Promicrosserus, as it gets bigger, it starts to develop spines. And there are these really big ones, which we actually call Zipherosserus. And it's thought that Zipherosserus is the female and Promicrosserus is the male of the same species but they existed for a very long time, so they're not very useful for ammonite zonation. Whereas the Asterosterus, or Asti as we'd call it, that's the one that allows us to date the rocks. And then we have Nautilus, the living fossil. So um, Nautilus has been around for yeah, 400 million years, hardly changed. It's got a chambered shell, very similar to the ammonite shell. There are differences, bottom left-hand side, can you see the ammonite chamber wall is very complicated, folded into this suture line, whereas the nautilus on the top there is a very simple suture line. Um, but because the shells are so similar, we can be pretty confident that the ammonite looked very like the living nautilus. And then we have this lovely story of the shell on and the shell off. We only see the suture lines if the shell pops off. And that's why the fossils are so beautifully preserved, because what we're looking at is a cast of the inside filled with calcite crystal. They also have a big long body chamber, and we saw that in the Promicrosserus. You see the, the very light shell? That's the chambered shell filled with calcite crystal, whereas the dark shell is the body chamber filled with mud washed in from the entrance. And then halfway down, you can see the body chamber of that sectioned ammonite, bottom left, is an ammonite with the shell preserved on it. So we can't see the suture lines and we can't see the difference between the, the body chamber and the rest of the shell. And then on the right hand side, we've got Asterosaurus stellari, beautiful big Asterosaurus. You can see the, the complicated suture line on the outside edge of the shell, the much simpler middle part of the chamber, and then the body chamber that's been missing. So that was a very much bigger ammonite. And we can, I'm just going to pop all those stories on the wall, but obviously they would be specimens. Next one, death of an ichthyosaur. So this is a, a, an ichthyosaur I found in 2012 called Justin. The head 
and the front paddles were strewn across a gully. I literally picked them up um, loose, hence it was rescued just in time. Um, and it's really interesting because you, can you see there's a whole cluster of vertebrae and then a whole balloon of ribs. And I think what's happened here is that our ichthyosaur it died. Bob, you don't mind me doing this to your work. The seabed. Rigor mortis pulled back. But also, as it started to decay, gases filled the body cavity and it started off the floor, only anchored down by the weight of the skull and the front paddles. And as it was in that position, it started to rot and the vertebrae tumbled out inside the bag of the body before the body burst and you get this preservation. This is called tophonomy. It's the story of what happens between death and burial. And, you know, an ichthyosaur like that is actually far more interesting than a perfect ichthyosaur because it tells this wonderful story. And we're going to stick that story on the wall. What's next? Uh, exceptional preservation. I'm going to finish with this one. Um, the reason why the fossils in West Dorset are so well preserved is due to the environment in which they were preserved. So much of the rock sequence contains black laminated mud, which formed on a stagnant and poisonous seafloor with very little oxygen. Most of the fossils we find are of creatures that lived in the open water. And when they sank down to the seabed, there was nothing down there to eat them and smash them and break them up. But also there's some chemistry magic going on in stagnant seafloors. So the iron parietes or fool's gold is made of iron and sulphur that combines on a stagnant anoxic seafloor. It filled the inside of the ammonite chambers very early on or the ammonite shell um, and pre prevents them being crushed. And a similar thing happens with the calcite ammonites. Here the, uh, the mud is cemented into a limestone very early on so the ammonites are not crushed and then calcium rich waters fill the inside allowing calcite crystal to replace the, the shell. <clears throat> um, but it, it extends to other things, the ichthyosaurs and the fish. The reason they're so well preserved is because they died, they sank to the seabed. There was nothing down there to eat them and smash them and break them up. You can see that ichthyosaurus lying in a laminated shale. It's actually nosedived. The skull has nosedived into the sediment. But that was clearly such a horrible environment. There's, there's no trace fossils down there. There are no shells. So the ichthyosaur died and was perfectly preserved. Same with the fish. We normally clean them from the underside because that is the better side because it literally just sank into the mud. And then up here, the, um, the, the squid, sometimes the process of decay has slowed so much that the soft parts become buried. We've got the ink sac and the outline of the body and even parts of the tentacles preserved. And it's the same with the ichthyosaur, actually. There's the skin and stomach contents in there because the process of decay was slowed long enough for the soft parts to be preserved. And it's the same with the insects. They're very, very fine, silty mud on the seafloor, not being disturbed by other animals. That allows these very delicate insects to be preserved. So we could call it stagnant world. Mm. Maybe not. Um, and then there's this sort of more famous story as well, a bloat and float. So ichthyosaurs, they're, they're negatively buoyant because if you're a hunter in the sea, you don't want to be fighting uh, buoyancy. So when they die, they sink to the sea floor. And here again, I've got Bob's artwork here. So the ichthyosaur sinks down to the sea floor. But in shallow waters, as they decay, the gases can build up and actually float the ichthyosaur back up to the surface where it starts to rot. So here the tail's fallen off and the string of the tail vertebrae are hanging out. They fall off down to the seabed and that explains this, uh, this cluster on the right hand side. Um, and then the, you know, the, the jaws and the head and the skull could fall off as it has with the big one there. So you end up with um, you know, scattered bones to partial ichthyosaurs um, preserved. But this one is really weird. This is Callum's ichthyosaur I cleaned for him 2015. I also call it Noah's ichthyosaur because it's it's a whole ichthyosaur in pieces. Um, I think what's happened here is that the ichthyosaur died, sank to the seafloor, but this seafloor was actually full of worms and the worms have literally just dispersed the whole skeleton, just broken it up. There are no bite marks on any of the bones, so it literally just biotubation as it's called. 
uh, because the repairs of everything these are the, the humerus the the upper arms um, that's the scapulas which are the shoulder bones and the scap and the clavicles uh, those I can't remember what they're called these are the dentry part of the lower jaw and then these are other parts of the lower jaws the lower jaws are made of three different bones each this is part of the upper skull the uh, premaxilla it's all there just completely biotivated broken up by the actions of worm and then we also have mechanical influences on exceptional preservation so the, uh, the open chambers of ammonites and nautilus can form a trap or perhaps even a shelter for smaller animals so you get these fantastic clusters of ammonites jammed into the body chambers and there are many better examples than that sometimes inside big shells the small ammonites are protected from the um, mineralization process of fossilization and the, the fine layers that cause mother of pearl are preserved so the light is broken up into the rainbow colors that's quite rare and then down here this big cluster of microdoceros there, there were six of them there are five there now the one the other one was outside the nodule they're like stacked like a stack of coins that have fallen over how on earth did that happen so again, we're going to stick that story on the wall and we filled our virtual gallery. Obviously, there are very many more stories we could talk about. Um, we could do in all sorts of different ways, but it's just to give a flavour. And we haven't talked about beautiful fossils. Again, there are many better examples than this, but, you know, why not? Just the aesthetics. They are exquisitely beautiful. Even things like that, like giant clam. Um, I think that's a stunner. <laughs> Um, but then it did take 50 hours to clean. So here's the gallery finished. We've got our outstanding universal value, the history or the life on the land. We've got life under the sea, which is obviously the big, big one. And then we've got a whole series of, of incredible stories which are linked to the specimen. Uh, there's no cgi there's no very little graphics or artwork it's just a you know simple idea and i haven't covered you know more incredible stories i haven't covered the middle jurassic with the inferior oolite phenomenal stuff um haven't they talked about dating the rocks absolutely microfossils how we find and clean fossils or recent finds recent research history of science or the dynamic coast um or what else if we talk to collectors there may be a whole range of other ideas and that's you know, delivered by collaborative effort. Um, and I haven't talked about the big stuff, extinction being the driver for evolution and climate change. I'll, I'll look to tack on another additional short talk to this if I have time. And most importantly, we actually have a list. We have a catalogue of fossils because we know what we want them for. Um, you know, I've only got 48 on there, but some are multiple. It took just three weeks to draw it up in preparing this talk. Um, monetary value there's the tricky bit it's that list is probably worth over two million pounds um, just four specimens in there particularly but the trick is to develop a project that the collectors you know want to see that they want to buy into they're engaged with and thinks credible and then the financial value may not be as important and also there there are sort of tax issues these are collections built up over 40 years 40 years of accumulated value then there may be tax um, benefits to the collectors in how they disperse those collections finish with um, are there enough fossils you know of course there are and this quality and standard is fantastic this is a world heritage site and um, we're only limited by our knowledge our imagination and creativity the mistakes of the last few years and the leadership and ambition that's required to deliver a unity of purpose um, you know it just it just has to be credible and f straightforward so there we are i'm going to finish there thank you